In studio with us, uh, the uh, right now, he is the head of it. Soon, he will be playing with his grandchildren. The president of the West Virginia Education Association, one of the two major teachers associations in the state, Dale Lee. Dale, good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming in. And you're right. I'm, soon I will be playing with those Already semi-retired, not wearing a tie. Which you disappointed know. you. <laughs> I'm just saying. I've, I've only, I've, I just met him in person today. I've talked to you a thousand times on, on the air, and I've always spoken to your picture, and, uh, and you're always wearing a tie. It, it just. I, I'm anticipating budget cuts, so I, I couldn't have a tie. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa Henry is here as well. Lisa, good morning to you. Good morning. Good to have you here. L Lisa is a legal Council of sorts of some way or another with the WVEA? What, what, no, what that mean? is not true. I'm an organizational development specialist, she's, which just means I'm a, a union rep. She's a union rep, uh, legal uh, uh, also because she's got that killer background in Boston where she carved people up and left them on the side to the just – Sweet innocent them. Lisa. Anyone You're never looking at no. we'll see that side you of her. dare challenge yeah. her in court, you paid the ultimate price. And see, that's what you get for him doing his investigative background work, Lisa. He would e except I was a, a business attorney. That makes, <laughs> no, Not a that makes no difference oh, to Rob. That's what you tell us, but we know the truth. We do know the truth. Yeah. When, when the truth gets in, way, in the way of a good story, yeah. go with the good story. Welcome to my world. Go there you go. Story. Print, print the rumor, right? That's print right. Print the legend. Uh, Dale, you as a former coach basketball coach for years tell us what you thought about the situation with the ssac right now you know it, it's a shame that you pick kids through this situation sure. I, I understand uh if i were a team that that should be in that's not i understand mm -hmm. the the anger and everything but but you have teams that have played all year uh have, have done remarkable job getting ready and now you mess up that routine and mess up the the timing and everything and and who knows how long this is going to go. So so you could actually see championship games well into December. And that, that's just wrong to do to kids. And, and I, I understand both sides of the issue. Uh, but come on, let's figure this out and let the kids play. That's the key, I think, figuring it out. It could have been done much earlier. Oh, yeah. Waiting to the last moment to uh, yeah. have the courts jump in. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, uh, they do rankings every week. Yeah. And it's not like that. All of a sudden, they said, "Oh, wait a minute! We're not going to make it, or we yeah. we should make it, and we're not." Mm -hmm. What about those schools that are in that should not be in? Well, you know, uh, again, what the problem that I see is when you when you change the classifications in midseason, and, and that uh, all this, in in my opinion, and and I have great respect for the SSAC. I mean, they do a, a, a really good job, but uh, uh, maybe this could have been done uh, beforehand. But but when you're trying something new, and that's what they were doing, and the, and the, the goal is to make it more competitive, more fair, and to get more teams the opportunity to play. Because having coached in, in the state basketball tournament uh, a couple times, there's nothing more exciting and nothing better than being there and ha even having that opportunity. So even the teams that go and lose the first game, it's that thought that will remain with those kids and, and the coaches, honestly, the, the rest of their lives. Uh, I mean, I can still – my youngest daughter – when I mean, my oldest daughter wasn't walking the first time we went to the state basketball tournament. And we played on a Wednesday and then played again on Friday – and she comes to the game on Friday. Her mom brought her to the game on Friday, and we're out warming up. And they, she sets her down on the uh, Civic Center floor, and she walks over to me. That's the first <laughs> steps I saw her take. And I never go in the Civic Center yeah. that I don't see this little baby girl walking toward me. So those yeah. are memories that sure. will last a lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a little lump in my throat right yeah. now. Yeah. That's a very poignant thought. What do you think about that word poignant, Bill? That's a good one, don't you That's think? a good one. That's one that you and John will have to discuss tomorrow. Break it up into how many syllables it can be broken into. <laughs> poignant. <laughs> Silent G. Hey, All right. Hang on a minute. Let me come in. <laughs> All right, so I'm, a, I'm a math teacher, so let me check that word. When, when you pronounce the holiday coming up on November the 28th, where do you put the accent? First syllable or second syllable, Dale? Turkey Day. Good way out of it. <laughs> How about you, Lisa? I'm not getting in that. <laughs> that. Thanksgiving. There's another way to say it. Yeah. Second syllable. So, right? Second syllable. Yeah. yeah. Bill does the first syllable. Thanks. Given. Yeah. 
So we were just kind of curious mm-hmm. as to different ways who hits the first syllable, who hits the second. Give it a shot, Dale. How do you say it? Thanksgiving. <laughs> Second the correct syllable. way. <laughs> <laughs> I did not. I did not well, pick this, up how this, he did. This has been fun. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, I will see you next time I'm over in the Eastern Panhandle. Speak, speak with, with a tie. With a tie. Yeah, with a tie. <laughs> what brings you to Martinsburg today? Uh, last night was the PEI hearing in Martinsburg, and and there's um, a series of those across the states. Uh, across the state, last week was in Beckley. Uh, last night in Martinsburg. Thursdays in Willing, and then next week we have Morgantown and, and Charleston, and then there's also an online uh, version of it. And it's an opportunity for people to go out and, and voice the concerns about the proposed plan that will be in effect July of, of this 2025. It's the 2025-2026 plan year. And the problem with it is we when the legislature passed Senate Bill uh, 268 everyone thought okay we're going to have a hard fast 80 20 we know we put money in every year whatever we put in the state puts 80 percent the employees put 20 percent and that's going to solve the problem well it doesn't solve the problem because you have continuing high drug cost you had now that we went to the providers uh, going from 59% of Medicare to 110% of Medicare. You had that added cost, uh, and they had to come up with more money. So the plan right now does a 14% premium increase for for employees, but more importantly, it does a 40% increase in deductibles and copays and out-of-pocket costs, which when you figure those in, the employees are paying more than 40% of the cost of this new plan. What happened to eighty twenty? And when they did eighty twenty, they were speaking strictly, strictly of the monthly uh, insurance premium. Strictly on the on the premium portion of it. Yes. Dale, in the past, when those ratios were calculated, did it take into account deductibles and the increased costs? Uh, it it hasn't in the past. Uh, they're they're relatively close. I would argue that they're relatively close, and and. Uh, the legislature will say, well, the deductibles and copays and things haven't been changed since uh, 2018. But there were years from about 2012 to 2018 where the state wasn't putting more money in, so you couldn't increase the premiums. But they kept chipping away at, at the uh, benefits. So it, it's a combination of both. Dale, how do you counter the argument that you hear push back all the time that compared to the private sector, their insurance costs are much more uh, higher than what would the um, uh, state employees? I understand that argument, but tell me any private plan in the last three years, well, the last two years in this proposed years, we've seen premium increases of 24.5%, 10.5%, and now 14%. Tell me any private plan that has seen a 49% increase in their premiums in the last three years. Uh, While I understand and and I say it at the public hearings, health care is a national issue. We can't solve this just in West Virginia. We can't solve why it costs so much to have the prescriptions in, in America that you can get in Canada for far less. We can't solve those problems here, but we can I'll go to the table and figure out a way that it's less painful on everyone. I have always said we know we have to have some skin in the game, but we're being skinned alive with this one. Dale, at these PIA meetings uh, that you had last night, uh, I suspect there's a lot of venom, of frustration. Were there any solutions posed? Actually, in the testimony that I give, I, I give some, some recommendations on, on some things to do. Um, one of the things that we recommend is that um, you have an administrative service fee. And this is the fee that uh, the employer pays for each uh, policyholder. It's been $50, and it's been $50 for as long as anybody can remember. It hasn't been changed. In this proposed plan, it's going up $2.50 a year for each of the next four years. That brings in about $164,000. So the proposal I said is why don't we go from $50 to $100. The legislature can put money into the plan that way without 
triggering the 80-20 premium increase. It's flow through money anyway because it's it's part of the funding formula for for the schools. Increase that, it's going to get you about $3.6 million if you double it to, to $100. And it would take care of some of the costs for our retirees and, and our uh uh, people who can least afford these increases. In, in addition to the 14% increase for the active employees, it's a 12% increase for our pre-Medicare retirees and, and along with all the benefit cuts. They haven't had a COLA and won't have a COLA for, for as, until the legislature says, all right, w- enough is enough. Uh, they can least afford it. Do employees um, in the program have a, a menu of – different programs that they can choose from there are there are different plans that you can have there's a plan a plan b plan c with different levels uh, of deductibles yes yes there are and different levels of of uh uh premium costs too um so so there is there are, a choice there of options. deductible what i call a catastrophic plan where if, if you can live with a very high deductible then it's actually a pretty affordable program i, I think that would be more on plan c and i'm not you know i'm I haven't studied the right. plans enough to, to, to really catch that. I believe that's Plan C, which is the, the high deductible, high uh, out-of-pocket costs. Uh, but most people in PEI are in Plan A or Plan B, and Plan B really takes care of the uh, everything in the state. The border counties uh, are generally in Plan A because, if you remember, PEI then said that the contiguous counties to out-of-state counties to West Virginia – fall under the same 80-20 guidelines for for the employees rather than a 70-30 split. Dale, some of our legislators have said that the state should not be in the insurance business, should get out altogether. What would be the downside to that? Well, the downside of that is it's going to cost the employees a lot more in in the long run. One, because the administrative costs for – and PEI is is really, in essence, a semi-private plan anyway. They – the state – is not the investor in in the plan that you have companies that bid out the uh, the pharmacies and and the hospital plans and things like that. But the administrative cost of PEI is less than eight percent, which means that ninety two percent of the the funds going into the plan go into the plan. On the private sector, it's generally an eighty twenty split. It's generally that twenty percent is administrative cost. While some private company may come in the first year and say, we're going to give you a whole lot cheaper premiums, they're for-profit companies, and they're for-profit for a reason. So those premiums and everything are going to continue to rise. Secondly, PEI is one of the few uh, plans that the premiums are based on your ability to pay. It, it has a salary uh, structure tier plan. In, in private plans, everyone's going to play, pay the same. So the, the custodian, the bus driver, the, the cook, the janitor is going to pay the same as the superintendent, and that's just not fair either. Uh, and the most important thing to me is you have people in Charleston that you can call and talk to, and, and you get the answers quickly. They understand West Virginia. They understand our people. So you can uh, have your uh, appeals heard immediately in the private plan you're going to get the robo call and and the the go through several different voice menus before you actually get to talk to someone and that person may be in california may be in uh, overseas or somewhere else that doesn't really understand what the what the west virginia needs you, are. you've mentioned two or three reasons that they should be uh, uh should be considered is are the legislators listening to you I hope so. Uh, I, I, I think that... Um, were any in attendance at your meeting last night? Yes, there were. Uh, um, Delegate Kump is always there. I mean, he's been there since I've been coming to these PEI hearings in the Eastern Panhandle. But uh, they they had interims yesterday, so, so it was a little more difficult for them to, to come back. Uh, I, I hope that I have an opportunity to, to speak with people. But, uh, you know... I, I know Delegate Hornby, Delegate Clark are looking at, at ways to in, increase salaries over here. Well, there's some things that we can do with PEIA too that that can can be a part of that. If you look at uh, the compensation package, it's it's salaries and benefits. So 
So there are some things that that they can introduce, and and I will be happy to to help them all. And I know they have the plan to introduce them. That can be helpful to everyone. Are the high costs in West Virginia driven by the limited availability of health care in so much of the state? Uh, no, I think the high cost to this plan is is the the uh, big part of it is the pharmacy cost, and particularly the the uh, weight loss uh, drug that that Ozempic. Well, yeah, that that everybody is using that that drove the cost tremendously high. And then the second big driving cost was going from 59% to the providers of Medicare to 110%. Uh, it, it but that solved the it. crisis of... It, it did solve a crisis, right. uh, but perhaps you could have phased that in over over years, uh, over a couple of years or rather than all at once. I, I will give the legislature credit for one thing, that um, there was an 87 or $89 million hole in this year's plan. And at the interims in October, they, they put the money in so that we wouldn't be faced with a large premium increase in January of this year's plan. So so they, they're understanding. I, I think it's more important for them to get us all back at the table and, and figure this out in the long run. Talking about the long run, uh, is there any optimism that this hole that we saw this year would not reoc- uh, would not occur in future years? Yeah, the the hole was really caused because of the increase in the provider and and then this uh, uh, drug costs that that went up, and part of the reason that the finance board has said that you have the premiums and and the deductibles increase as large as it is this year is to stabilize this cost over the the next four years. For example, the next year's plan projection of premium increase is only 4.9. Well, I would rather have, rather than a big chunk and then a small chunk and then go back to a big chunk, let's stabilize it and and know that, so I know what my increases are each year and and you can plan on that. Did the governor make a mistake, Dale, in holding the premiums steady for, I think it was seven years, so uh, there were no increases well, or very small ones? And then all of a sudden, because of that, you had to catch up with a big one? That that led to the 24.5% increase that we had uh, uh, two, two years ago, three years ago. Yeah. And, and, that's, and, and they will say, well, we're giving you raises to, to p- offset those costs. And they are. But when you give the raises to offset the cost, then you're not increasing people's buying power any. It doesn't help you with your electric bill. It doesn't help you with groceries, with gas, with the cost of living over here. So you're losing ground with your buying power over that. Uh, we, we've we had raises, school employees have had raises for the last five years. and. We're 50th in the nation still in, in pay and, and may drop to 51st because they also include D.C. in those rankings. Do you have a sense of, of all of the people involved in PEIA, what percentage are teachers, are school people? Uh, my guess is, gosh, that's a great question. I've never thought of that before. My guess is probably about half. Okay. And the rest uh, would be police uh, and fire? And well, it would be... Uh, State road employees, workers, right. road workers, and, and, and they're also... Are they actively involved in this too? There, there have been some at the, at the public hearings, yes, but it's more difficult for them to come and, and, and speak out. Um, and, and there are also uh, counties and municipalities uh, are in a non-state agency's fee, and their, their premiums are going up 16%. But in many counties and many municipalities, the the employer pays 100% of the cost for, uh, like, uh, I know one town where they pay a little less than most people could make on the private sector, but they pay 100% of their insurance premiums. And, and with these increases, that may change over this next year. Dale, earlier you said that the, uh, the premiums are based upon salaries mm-hmm. and not health risk. This mm-hmm. is an issue that I've heard several legislators raise that it should be the other way around. Premiums should be based upon health risk and not the salary. Well, and, and I understand that, but when that happens, you, you get to a point where you can't afford the insurance. And, and that's, that's going to really do harm to, to more and more of our, our people. Uh, there was a reason that this was devised the way it was 
with the, the salary scales is so that it can be affordable for everybody and everybody could have the good insurance. If, if you had the major health risk, you may not be able to afford the, the best plan. You may have to go to the extremely high deductible, the extremely high cost. Uh, and again, the, in the private sector, you're getting raises and stuff every year that, that help that not only offset the premium increase, but to increase your buying power. We're not seeing that. Those are the arguments of young, healthy people. And when you've, you're, you're paying your insurance <coughs> for that time, you, your kid might fall out of the tree and break his, his mm -hmm. arm or something like that. But then there comes a point late in life where there's, there's the cancer or something that has to be taken care of. And the money's not there to pay for the cancer treatment or for the heart disease or whatever. And people become uninsurable. That's the problem with, with insuring the risk rather than right. insuring the, yeah. Yeah, some other is. way. It is. Dale Lee is uh, our guest here on the program, along with Lisa Henry. Where, where are you headed next, Wheeling? Yes, I'm, uh, I'll be leaving here today. I'll drive over to Wheeling, uh, stay in Wheeling tonight, and visit some schools tomorrow, and then go to the public hearing at uh, 6 o'clock. Are the comments relatively the same regardless of where you are in the state when it comes to PEIA, Dale? Um, there's been two so far, and, and they are, except that here – in the eastern panhandle what i heard last night was more people are really contemplating having to leave the state and go to virginia to to make the more money and you already have a, a teacher shortage all around the state particularly in the eastern panhandle and but this may just exactly they call that a thousand dollars a mile yeah. right yeah yeah we've been hearing that for quite a while is there truth to that actually happen or is that just a, a leverage point I, I think there is some truth to yeah. that. Uh, uh, there, we we see we see more and more people leave. One uh, our um, one of the testimonies last night was she's been at their school for 15 years and she's seen one retirement at her school. Uh, a lot of people have left, but only one person stayed long enough to actually retire there. Uh, the rest of the people are going either leaving the profession or going across the state line. Have you been to one of these meetings where someone has had an idea and you said, yes, that's, that's a great solution. We should, we should rally around <coughs> that idea. Uh, most, most of the, the, the discussion is telling the effects of what this is going to do to people. So, so, uh, you know, we're, we're not healthcare experts and it's more difficult to make those suggestions. That's why uh, we at, at the WVEA have made these suggestions and, and have some more that, that can help. But it's going to involve people sitting down at the table and saying, all right, what are you willing to give? What, what are the providers willing to do? What are the drug companies willing to do? And, and then you'll get to some stability. Dale, thanks for stopping by. Thank you guys for having Thanks, me. And I'll, I'll never come back again without a tie. I can get you. Remind him that, will you, Lisa? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Lisa I, 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 I felt I felt just yeah, naked the whole day. Well, we thought you were kind of naked the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, nine o'clock. This is Talk Radio. WRI Martinsburg and TV Ten. Back with more after these.